All right. I'll tell you the truth. So I've had this camera out for about a month, and now that we're through the honeymoon phase, I'm starting to see this camera for what it really is, and also what it isn't. Now that the Sony Brano has been hitting the streets, a lot of people have ended up with mixed feelings, and I'm kind of in the same boat. A camera this expensive shouldn't have as many issues as it does, but at the same time, this camera does exactly what I want it to do, and that's provide an exceptional image and an operator-friendly form factor. So first, I'll talk about what I really like about the camera, and right off the bat, it feels surprisingly solid right out of the box. My camera was pretty stripped down for the first couple weeks because I was waiting on my Airy Pro set to arrive, but it was still very usable with a handful of mounting points on the top of the body as well as on the stock handle, which is a lot sturdier than you think it is. I will say that having proper support does make the camera 50% better, and I opted to go with the Airy kit because I'm a big fan of their de design philosophy and all those accessories are interchangeable with my Mini LF. I'll do a separate video next week detailing all the accessories I'm currently running, so be sure to subscribe if you're not already. Like I said, the image quality is phenomenal, both in full frame 8.6K and Super 35 5.8K. I noticed an instant image quality bump coming from the FX6 and FX9, which is good because that's exactly what I was looking for. The image has the same richness that you'd find from a Venice and feels more like a Venice 2 than a Venice 1. And that being said, we shot alongside of Venice 1 for an entire week and both look amazing. Another small improvement is that we finally have control over playback speed. And this was easily my biggest gripe with previous Sony cameras. And you can now use the home screen to toggle playback speed similar to the Venice. It only took $25,000 and a Cine Elsa badge. Yikes. Speaking of the home screen, I love having all of these settings just readily available when I'm running an external monitor. It's great being able to select settings just like an Alexa without having to use the direct menu to scroll all the way across the screen just to change a few settings. Another good thing about this camera is that the media is openly available using CF Express Type B cards, and I haven't got any errors or drop frames using third-party cards using all codecs and frame rates, but you do still get that annoying error saying that the media isn't guaranteed because the cards aren't VPG400 certified, even though your minimum speeds well exceed the VPG400 standard. I imagine most manufacturers just aren't interested in spending the extra money to get their cards certified, so just keep that in mind when you're shopping around for media. One of my favorite things about the camera is having that native E-mount hidden right under the PL mount. When I'm doing dock or corporate work, E-mount glass is hands down the easier option for most of the time because they're super light, optically precise, and not to mention include autofocus, which I use on probably 99% of my jobs, even when I have dedicated ACs. Zoom lenses are both expensive and heavy, and exponentially so when you require full-frame coverage. So being able to use a Sony glass I already own is just a great option. All right, so what about the not so great? New Sony cameras are pretty notorious for having super weird quirks when they come out. And believe me, the Brano's full of them. My biggest complaint is probably the nitpicky output formats because I literally have to reference a spreadsheet basically any time I'm using an external monitor. So for starters, you can only have SDI overlays when you're recording XOCN, which is sort of unfortunate because most clients just don't need RAW, so anytime you're using XAVC, you'll be stuck with a clean feed on your monitor. Apparently, this is because the HDMI output path has more room for processing than SDI. Uh, there are a few other notable mentions. One, HDMI can have overlays in all modes. Two, you can only output with both HDMI and SDI in the full frame crop 6K and Super 35 mode in XAVC. Three, your only 4K SDI option is also in that same mode in XAVC. Four, SDI D-Squeeze is only available when recording in XOCN, otherwise you have to use HDMI. Five, most modes, you're generally picking one or the other in terms of SDI and HDMI. Either way, the output formats are just annoyingly picky, so if you're ever having trouble, that cheat sheet will probably help. I recently did a show where we used seven Branos, and I needed to see all the overlays, so our workaround was to run 
the onboard monitors through HDMI and then just loop out via SDI. It's not a huge deal breaker, but it's still annoying that I have to bust out HDMI cables in 2024. Speaking of overlays, they're still a little bit clunky with the on-screen displays just cluttering up the entire frame. You think that with that shiny new Cine Alta badge, there would be an option to have all the information surrounding the frame like a Venice, but eh. A lot of people have also been addressing their concerns over the rolling shutter, and while I do agree that it is pretty bad, no one had mentioned it, even though it was there in Sony's launch films. On our cooking show, we did have a lot of close-ups and quick pans, and it was for sure noticeable, especially when you're on the longer end of a 100 to 400. CVP recently reported some pretty staggering readout speeds, and yes, it's bad, but I still think for the vast majority of work that I'm doing, it's not gonna be a huge issue. The only thing I've noticed that I don't really love so much is the rolling shutter, but I'm also, I've been operating on a 100 to 400 the whole time, so that could have an effect on how bad the rolling shutter is, so. It doesn't seem unusable. It's just a little, a little much for a $25,000 cinema camera. But all in all, it seems pretty great, and now I want one, so. One of my biggest headaches is actually with the viewfinder for a variety of reasons. First of all, the design is a bit comical and borderline unusable without the mid-49 swivel bracket. When you're using the loop eyepiece, which is massive by the way, the viewfinder has to be as far forward as possible so that it's in an ergonomic position, but the camera needs to be farther back so that the lens mount is right over the shoulder for proper balance. But the attached cable, is egregiously short and is neither removable nor replaceable. And worst of all, if you're on a wide angle lens, the damn thing shows up in frame. Oh! It would be nice if the viewfinder part were on the front of the camera with standardized connectors like it is on the Venice or Alexa. It sort of doesn't make sense why we need to needlessly run this non-removable cable all the way to the back of the camera. But hey, that's just my opinion. For $25,000, I think the remote grip should have been included, and I would have rather paid extra for a separate EVF or some other solution that makes operating off the shoulder a little bit more ergonomic. Heck, I would have even been happy paying $5,000 for the viewfinder that they already sell for the F55 in Venice. So this camera obviously has a ton of resolution, and I could honestly care less about AK, but Another thing a lot of us have noticed is that the full frame crop 6K scan mode is noticeably softer than the full frame 8.6K and even Super 35 5.8K modes. Side by side at the same magnification, the full frame and Super 35 look identical because they're essentially one-to-one -one readouts, but the 6K crop looks like there's some weird downsampling going on, which is unfortunate because that's where I think most of us would spend most of our time for the higher frame rates and 4K downsample because 99% of clients just don't need AK. That being said, I can guarantee the end user, meaning the audience, probably just won't notice. I've had no complaints about everything that I've shot using that full frame crop 6K mode, but I almost feel like the Burano is a better Super 35 camera than it is a full frame camera because you can maintain those higher frame rates and get a really nice one-to-one -one pixel readout and even get a slightly faster response time, according to CVP. It would be great to see a 4K downsample option from the full frame scan mode, even if there was limited frame rates. That all being said, I think the most disappointing thing for me, which not a lot of people are talking about, is the IR pollution. So really quick, for those that might not know, when you use a traditional ND filter, you block out visible light, but infrared wavelengths are still allowed to pass through. And although it's not visible to us, the sensor still detects that light and is represented as a reddish tint since it leans towards the red end of the spectrum. You can most noticeably see IR pollution and black fabrics because they absorb more light across the spectrum. To combat this, you would typically use something that's called a hot mirror or IR cut filter to reduce the amount of IR hitting the sensor. Nowadays, there are things called full spectrum NDs that also lower exposure while also limiting the amount of infrared wavelengths hitting the sensor. If you wanna learn more about full spectrum NDs, I did this video a few years ago, which you can check out. 
I was recently on a shoot with the Murano and we were doing a day exterior and before I even started rolling on our first take, I could see a bunch of infrared just creeping up in the blacks, which is interesting because I never once had any complaints when using the FX6 or FX9, which supposedly uses the same variable ND. So the fact that I was immediately able to notice that level of pollution was concerning. And that's because IR pollution isn't really something that you can correct in post. So you have to really make sure that you get it right in camera. So I ended up doing some testing using the internal and also my external Schneider Rhodium full spectrum NDs. And it's pretty apparent once you see them side by side. For comparison, I did the same test with the Mini LF and everything looks pretty normal. Again, I was shocked because I never noticed that much pollution on the FX6 or FX9. So I even tested the FX6. And even though you can see a little bit of infrared creeping in, I don't think it's nowhere as near bad as the Verano, which is four times more expensive, which is a bummer. It makes me wonder if the variable ND is actually the same as the FX series or if Sony just took some shortcuts with the OLPF so that they could squeeze an IBIS. I don't know, that's just me speculating, but the fact that I was immediately able to notice a difference leads me to believe that they changed something. Deja vu is usually a glitch in the matrix. It happens when they change something. So the last thing I'll mention is the price. It's obviously pretty steep at $25,000. And once you purchase all the accessories and media you need, you're probably looking at 30 to $35,000 all in. At this point, you can buy a fully loaded Venice One for much cheaper than a Murano, which is sort of mind boggling because you're getting much more image quality for a much cheaper price. The Murano is in a tough position because on one hand, you're getting a reasonably compact cinema camera, but with below average readout speeds. You get world-class autofocus, but with really bad IR pollution. You get Venice level raw recording, but with super selective output formats. Like anything else, this is just another tool. And at the end of the day, it just kind of depends on the work you do. If you always have the luxury of having an AC and are constantly doing crude projects where you can justify having that level of camera, sure, a Venice makes total sense for the right owner operator or growing production company. For me as a freelance DP, the Prano is just enough camera for my needs that it can fit into about 90% of the jobs I'm on, even with all the drawbacks I just mentioned. At the end of the day, the Verano does some things exceptionally well, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little disappointed. Am I returning the camera? No, but for $25,000, I was expecting a little bit more.